the sperm cell and an ovum fuse. Genetic information of a human man and a woman merge together. Life begins with only one single cell capable of one of the most impressive features of life, the potential to renew itself. And so it does. It divides into two exact copies of itself, and then again, and then again. At the beginning, all the cells of the embryo look the same. But then, all of a sudden, they change. As if touched by an invisible hand, some of them start to look different. They transform into something else. What was once a single cell is enough to form hands and feet, a head, a lung and a heart for the fetus. From a single cell, you get a full animal body. And this is like, um, like, like almost like a miracle. But how can a bunch of cells that are only copies of each other do all of this? How does each one of them know what to do and when? A simple question to ask, but still one of the basic mysteries of life. If you look at the complexity and diversity in all of us, there's so much, there's absolutely so much, and it all has to be come from those 46 bits of DNA that are in each of us. The long-term aim was really to understand, you know, this particular process so that we could control whether, you know, how cells would differentiate. So how the cell work, single cell work, is already a fantastic, almost, almost like a miracle, and then how the cell in our body can cooperate and organize and communicate among the cells is something that's still it's, to me, it's like unbelievable. But as unbelievable as life might be, it exists. So how does this work? To shed light on how an organism develops from a single cell to a fully functioning body, we need more than one scientist. So we started for this cell fate a European project um, a bit more than five years ago. Our interest was to bring together structural biologists and cell biologists. When I moved to Cambridge, I started speaking to Ernest, and then he got in touch with Luciano, and we knew we wanted to put something together to try and coordinate efforts around Europe to look at this complex. We decided to team up together to approach and to try to answer very difficult question that can only be addressed by approaching from different aspects. In the end, 12 different institutes from eight countries join the group. They're all specialists in different fields, but they all want to know how cells develop. And so they name their joint venture the 4D Cell Fate Project. During our life, we change a lot, right? From a single cell, we become an embryo, a baby, then become a strong and uh, adult, and then maybe a wise old man, right? So in adult tissues, we have what's called multipotent or sometimes unipotent stem cells. They can make a few cell types, or they can make one cell type. So this is important because our blood, for example, is turning over constantly. There's some ridiculous number of 10 to the 13 cells per day, I think, we need to be making. The human body is made up of 100 trillion cells, differentiated in about 200 different cell types. And all of them need to be renewed after a certain time. This is only possible because we have stem cells in our tissues. These stem cells keep dividing throughout our lives, and they're the only ones with the potential to become specific types of cell at a certain point in time. They can become neurons in our brain, communicating with other cells through long extensions. They can become blood cells transporting oxygen through our veins. They can become muscle cells in our heart, making this precious organ beat. The constant self-renewal of cells is what keeps us alive. Understanding how a stem cell becomes a specific type of cell is therefore one of the basic mysteries of our biology. All of the cells of our body carry the same DNA in their core. This genome tells every cell what to do. But how can cells look so different and do so many different jobs if all of them carry the same genetic information? The DNA was discovered in, in the 50s. We thought actually that 
By reading the DNA, we could understand exactly how every single organism is made. But actually that was not enough, because then we realized that this, the, the information of the coding sequence is not sufficient to explain difference between cell type and cell type, or even between organisms. Actually, we are, we are almost 99% similar to, to non-human primates, like uh, orangotango and, and, and monkeys. And the difference in the coding sequence is not sufficient to explain the difference that are between these two different species. So there must be something more. The DNA is never all by itself. It's always wrapped in, in other proteins that are always associated with it. And it's how you modify some of those proteins that can affect whether genes are transcribed or not. Two important groups of modifying proteins are studied in the 4D sulfate project, Polycomb and NERD. Both of them interact with the DNA and affect how it's used. So these proteins have the potential to explain why every cell looks so different. But the processes are very complex. To understand them, Luciano de Croce's subproject takes a look at the polycomb complex. So we have the hypothesis that polycomb protein can actually dictate also the cell fate of uh, embryonic stem cells. So which means if an embryonic stem cell has to go to our uh, neurons or, or to our cardiac cells, so and it could be regulated by polygon protein. That was our original hypothesis. So in order to validate that, what we did, we remove several of the polygon protein from the cells, and we try to see whether the cells were still capable of giving rise to neurons or to cardiomyocytes, which are the cells that allow the heart to beat. They take embryonic mouse cells and grow them in a Petri dish, but they modify them in a way that a specific variant of polycomb is missing in some cells, MEL18. Under the microscope, they can see how the cells in the dish evolve with MEL18. They turn into cells that work like the cells of a heart muscle. They beat, contracting like in a pumping heart. First time uh, Alessandra showed me this, then uh, I was really astonished. So the, the fact that you can see um, cells that are beating in a petri dish was something that was, was like really, really amazing. Next up is the dish where the polycomb compound MEL18 is missing. The cells are silent. They could have turned into heart muscle cells, but they didn't. Without MEL18, they couldn't. It's a breakthrough for Luciano and his team. So the difference um, that you can see here, that when we remove polygon from the cells, the cells cannot differentiate properly into cardiomyocyte. You can see here that they don't beat anymore. So which suggests that polygon is an important player in order to get proper ESL differentiation into cardiomyocyte. It's a big step on the way to understanding how decisions are made on the fate of cells, and to maybe even turn this fate around one day. We can actually reset the clock, which means we can take a differentiated cells, a cells, for example, which are capable of beating, and we can set it back to a pluripotent stem cell. This actually is a process which is called reprogramming. So once you can reprogram the cells back in time, they can now be again capable, it's a pluripotent cells, capable of going in the direction you want, you can actually use this trick for curing a lot of potential human disease. If the processes of self-renewal don't work as they should, it can affect the whole body. This is what Brian Hendrick aims to study in his subproject of 4D cell fate. So, for example, in the blood, if a stem cell or a cell becomes a dot stem cell-like properties and then starts to divide when it shouldn't and starts to divide and divide and divide, that becomes leukemia. Understanding how protein can malfunction, and particularly polycom protein can malfunction, and we know that most of them are actually misregulated in a large number of human pathology. And identification of uh, uh, specific small uh, compounds, inhibitors, which can block this malfunction is actually one of the key points, one of the key aspects of our 4 d sulfate European project. Blocking these malfunctions could have a huge impact on medicine. But to understand why and how a cell turns into something as bad as a cancer cell, 
we need to understand the decisions made by each single cell. The other key part was to, was to develop methods to study genome structure in individual cells. So up to now, mostly people have studied you know, millions of cells at a time. But as it turns out, the structure in every cell is completely different. Um, so you can only look at this, really, if you look at the level of a single cell. It's at the level of the single cell that the decision is made. So we need to understand how a single cell does this. Now, trying to understand gene expression in one cell is technologically very difficult. Zooming in deeper was a huge challenge. To get a clearer picture of each individual cell, Ernest Lau's subproject intends to study cells on the level of single molecules. Developing the single molecule microscopy was important because we wanted to be able to, to study things like that and to understand how molecules actually do function. When we started this, people didn't really think it would be possible to look at single molecules deep inside the nucleus anyway. So that was, that was the motivation for doing it. Developing new methods in science can be like seeing things anew. Witnessing what a single molecule does in a cell can reveal stories about life in a cell that we have never heard before. But it took years of work to get there. Biochemistry had to be combined with physical and technical skills to make the invisible visible. But in the end, Ernest and his team members, Srinyan and Wei, succeed. What you see here are single molecules floating around in a cell. So for the first time, the group could actually see the proteins that determine the fate of cells. In particular, these methods allow you to map not just where a protein is, within the cell, but how it interacts with other proteins. In other words, you can produce an interaction map across the cell. The computer helps to gather all the pieces of information together. With its help, it's possible to calculate what the genome in a cell looks like. It was initially surprising that genome structure would be so different in every cell. We sort of had the idea initially when we started out that it might be fundamentally similar in most cells. And, and of course, what we learned is that that's not the case. It's actually totally different in every cell. Responsible for these differences are proteins like polycomb and NERD. By binding to the DNA, they change its structure and this controls which parts of the genome are in use and which are not. So this is part of the story why so many different types of cells exist, even though the differences in their genomes are not that striking. annual meetings, members of the 4D Cell Fate project get together to discuss their findings. Getting connected to others is a lasting benefit of this project. It helps create cohesion amongst European partners. So I have a lot of people I now know and I consider colleagues that I didn't know before. And this is helpful. Solving problems together is the aim of all 4D cell fate scientists. I think what we're doing is really geared at, at understanding the basic sciences. I and mean, obviously that's probably quite a long way in the future. No, in a very optimistic uh, view, I would say we advance a lot. But I have to also be critical and I know that this, this advance lead, always leads to more and more questions. More and more questions seem to be the nature of science, and maybe of life in general. The 4D Cell Fate project came to an end in 2016, but its members will continue to look for answers, trying to one day understand how decisions about the fate of our cells are made. <laughs>